One more time to entertain you. Coming back to the stage is our co-editorial lead, Lisa Granistein, in conversation with a true, true trailblazer. Broadcaster from Fox Sports, Aaron Andrews. Hi. Wow. I really walked in at the wrong time, huh? <laughs> People aren't going to come back in. Did you get gifts? I heard there was a grab bag, a gift bag. <laughs> you know, the bar is high. Right. Very high. Very high. So cocktails, sex toys. Right. All right let's I talk was sports. brushing my teeth when my hair and makeup came into the hotel room, and I left the door open, and they're like, Aaron, and I was like, I'm just brushing my teeth. That's all I'm doing. So <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> All right, we're talking sports, different kind of sport. Oh yeah. All right, so you've, you've done a ton of different sports. You grew up around sports. You watched sports with your dad. Did you play sports? I never played. I was just fully a spectator. Um, Mom and dad married. I'm the oldest. I have a younger sister. And uh, I was telling Lisa earlier today, my my uh, dad is, uh, he's still on television. He works for an NBC affiliate in Tampa. And my mom, when um, I was growing up, she was a public school art teacher. So my mom was at work Monday through Friday. My dad had me. And then when my dad went to go host uh, or anchor the weekend news, my mom had me. And so Monday through Friday was my dad's time to make me a hardcore sports fan. And um, I learned all about the Boston Celtics, the Boston Red Sox, the Green Bay Packers. Um, <laughs> So yeah, and the coolest thing for me was because my dad's such a great storyteller and that he does it for a living. He told me all about you know um, the players and just what drove you know what drives them and and the teams and the organizations and the coaches. And I just grew to love all the stories with all those guys and and knew right away I wanted to work in the industry. So how did you break in and what was it like being a woman back then on the sidelines? To be honest, well, how I broke in my first job out of college, I was the ringside reporter, traveling sideline reporter for the Tampa Bay Lightning, um, who broke my heart this year. They were absolutely fantastic during the regular season and fell flat on their face during the postseason. And then I laid on my kitchen floor for two hours after <laughs> game one, after they were up 3 nothing and then lost. Um, so I, that's how I broke in. And then I only had my job for five months, and Turner Sports came and hired me to go national um, to do the Braves broadcast. That's when they were on TBS for two years. I got fired from that. They, I, I didn't get fired. They didn't renew my contract because I sucked. I was horrible. Um, <laughs> I, I knew nothing about baseball, but because – Turner came calling and they were national and I was with the you know just the hometown NHL team my dad's like you can't let national TV go by you know this is baptism under fire you got to get out there you got to cut your teeth and I cut my teeth I was freaking horrible I mispronounced guys names I froze up on stage I sucked and um, they I just wasn't casted in the role that I, I needed to be in I, I didn't excel in what I was doing and and they let me go and the cool part was that's Charles Barkley was you know he still is at Turner and I became friends with him and and he said y'all are gonna regret when she leaves and they did I went to ESPN in a tryout role they hired me for the NHL playoffs and I um, was hired yeah, just for the NHL playoffs, Tampa Bay Lightning went to win the Stanley Cup playoffs the year that I was working as a reporter, which was freaking awesome. And I signed a three-year deal after that, and then I signed another three-year deal, and then from there I went to Fox. But uh, you asked me, and that was a really long answer, about being a female in the industry. I have, since day one, just kind of put my nose to the grindstone. And when I was with ESPN, I worked every single sport. I did numerous games a week. I did two football games a week. I did three college basketball games a week. I did one major league baseball game and then did the college world series and the little league world series and then that turned into the spelling bee and then back to college football so i'm exhausted i, I don't worked, know about you guys <laughs> i worked my ass off because i said when i was in my 40s i wanted to have a family and a baby and never look back i'm 41 we're trying to have a baby and i have 15 other projects going and i'm not ready to quit <laughs> So I never ever once thought about being a female in the industry because I really never had time. Yeah. And I didn't care that I stuck out. I thought it was cool. Did the guys care that you stuck out? I mean, guys care, yeah. you know, they care. Yeah. They give you a hard time. No, I was never given a hard time because I think guys know right away, you know, there's not a lot of fluff to me. I'll tell you right away if, That's you true. know, 
I didn't put enough deodorant on, or God, I'm tired, and these bags have never looked worse under my eyes. So I, I think I kind of cut through all the BS with that. Yeah, there's always like the guy that's like, hey, are you for real? Um, and, and yeah, I've gone through my stuff, but I have been so lucky that people really haven't harassed me that bad for being a female in the industry. And I think when it's been finally time to realize, God, I'm, I'm one of 30 that travel for college, fo or college football, I work in the NFL now, hello. Um, <laughs> Thursday night football and for Sunday football, I'm, I'm one woman out of 30 to 40 men that travel with our crew. I'm the only one at dinner uh, that's a female. But it never really bothers me. The only time it bothers me is when I want to talk about Kardashian gossip and none of them have anything to offer. So... <laughs> Do you it's go rude. into locker rooms? And what do you, what's your I used on to that? when I was younger. I used to when I was interning. Um, I, I don't anymore, not because, you know, I, I don't I'm not supposed to be in there, but it's because my interviews are done right after the game, yeah. right right as the game ends. So mm -hmm. I don't need to go into the locker room. We when we come into town and we meet with the teams, Tom Brady gets sent to us. We don't go to his locker, you know, like I sit with Antonio Brown, they come to us. We sit in a big formal meeting room and, and everything like that. How do you prep? How do you get ready for a game? More than I ever did when I was in college, which is unfortunate. I would have been able to wear one of those cool like ribbon things or lavaliers around my neck when I graduated. Mine was absolutely bare. Um, thanks, mom and dad. Um, <laughs> I, I study my rear end off. I, um, you know, this day and age with social media and, uh, you know, there's uh, NFL Live is on and NFL Network. I'm just reading as much as I can. So. You know, doing two games a week is wicked hard, but what we we'll all do is you go back like three to four months in advance. Like right now, on my flight home tonight to LA, I've got to start digging into training camp because we have the third preseason game of the season against Miami. We've got to, you know, you just got to start following guys. You got to see once they start reporting to camp who's doing well, who's got an injury that's lingering, who's, you know, pissed off about their contract. So you've got to read far back, and there's just so much information right now. It's kind of crazy, and it, it, it's a lot. My husband's always like, are you on Twitter? I'm like, not for gossip. I'm on for football news so, and sometimes gossip. How do you stay pumped? Like, how do you, how do you stay motivated? And we were talking a little bit yeah. about music. Um, so how oh, yeah. I stay motivated, I love the sport so much. So it's not really hard for me to stay motivated because yeah. I love it so much. Week five, week six, your bum's dragging a little bit. I also do Dancing with the Stars as well. So you get a little exhausted. It's a lot of back and forth that, you know, I'm flying all over the country. But um, you realize when, you know, it's, it's game time and the coin flip happens and it's the national anthem mm -hmm. and when they're getting ready to throw it down to me and I'm like, la, 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 I'm getting ready and I'm like, woo! And then after my first hit, I'm like this because I still love it so much. Do you so, still get nervous doing Oh my hits? God, yeah. My really? first hit that I'll do right after Joe and Troy go, Joe Bach, Troy Aikman, let's send it down Aaron Andrews. I am crapping myself. Like, <laughs> and this, you know, it'll be my, my seventh game of the week, but I, or the, or the season. So yeah, because I love it so much and you work your ass off and I have 15 seconds not to screw it up and you better hope you go before the ball is snapped or before the national anthem is sung or holy crap, a linebacker <laughs> is coming, let me get out of the way. And you better not screw it up. You better not say someone's name wrong. And it's awesome. How do you stay? <laughs> How do you stay warm? Um, warm is not the issue. Going to the bathroom is the really? issue. So think about it. Let's say I have a one o'clock game, right? One o'clock game. We are picked up at the hotel 8:45 a.m. One o'clock game. So that means hair and makeup done, you, the outfit that you're wearing better not get wrinkled before one o'clock. And me, I have to wear like what I'm wearing. I can't go change because this just in, there's no dressing room down in the stadium, like down at the you know, stadium. There's one bathroom for all the people down on the field. That's not the players, that's the officials, that's the photogs, that's the media. And those bathrooms are Saturday Night Live skits. They are <laughs> disgusting. And so I usually get to pee, no joke, 10 o'clock in the morning, kick is at one, I have no time. You ca I can't go at halftime because I have to run in with the coach, then run out with another coach, barely have time to maybe like blow my nose, eat a granola bar, walking out, do my hit. And then at, right after the game, I have to rush to get on a plane because I have to get either to Dancing with the Stars or my next game. So literally it's been 10 hours and I'm like, I'm gonna lose a kidney. This is really, <laughs> really bad. Not to mention, go have a cocktail on a plane when you haven't peed all day. You're wasted after one <laughs> sip. It's incredible. Good to know. <laughs> really incredible. 
All right, so, so we talked sports. Let's talk dancing a little bit. Yeah. Um, Dazzlers, what were they? So I was on a, I went to the University of Florida, SEC up in here. Vols, love you. Um, your stadium is amazing, one of the best. Your dance team, one of the greatest, too. I was always very jealous of their outfits. So I was on the college dance team, and we were called the Dazzlers. Okay. That was basically that. I loved it because I got to be down on the floor. Florida went to the national championship, got their butts kicked against Michigan State. My senior year of college, it was so awesome because not only was I excited to be there and dance for halftime, but I also knew all the players on the opposing team. So I was the dancer that was harassing, like, you know, Jason Williams on Duke. I'm like, you suck. You only scored this amount. And he remembers me to this day. He was like, oh, my God, you were that mouthy, annoying dancer on Florida's <laughs> team. Yeah. Is that how you got your gig at Dancing with the Stars? No, I'm kidding. No. I'm kidding. No, but how, how, did you, uh, how did you make your, your way on there as a contestant? Well, I just, I love dancing, and it was the hot show at the time, and I had wanted to be, you know, a part of it and hoped my legs would look like Stacey Keebler when she did it back in the day <laughs> pre-George Clooney. And I, yeah, I just wanted to be a part of it, and I finally got my shot. And then the cool thing with our show is once you're a part of the Dancing with the Stars mafia, you're always a part of it. Mm. So um, they wanted a, a new co-host, and I was up for it. And yeah, it's how been long, a good time. How long have you been doing that? I don't know. I think since 2014. Oh, so wow. and we go it's two shows a, a year. Yeah, it's been a while. So what's it like? Sh I mean, shifting gears. Uh, you know, you're dealing with testosterone and like on the field, and then you're in ball gowns and. It's totally different. So Sundays are wild because we'll have like a 3.30 or 4.30 kick, right? So if I'm in Green Bay, we don't get out of there till 7.30, get on a flight, usually don't land till one or two in the morning, try to get to bed, get to sleep after you've been jacked up on coffee all day. And then you, I have to be in my car ready to roll at 8.15, get to the Dancing with the Stars studios, and we're there till eight o'clock at night. So I was telling Lisa earlier, you know, you go from being like on the road for Thursday night football, Sunday afternoon, you know, something always big happens on Sunday. So I get to my dressing room at Dancing with the Stars. I have like the highlights on. And I get in the hallway and we're going to dress rehearsal. I'm like, holy crap, did anyone see Aaron Rodgers, you know, ripped his knee open and then came back and won the game? And they're like, no, but wait till you see Whitney Samba. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, let's see it. So I have nobody to talk to about football at yeah, all. Yeah. But damn it, she nailed it. So let's talk about the other football, the okay. women's soccer. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about what's been going on in terms of pay equity, in terms of Megan, and how you know the team has been criticized and, and celebrated? What's your take on this whole thing? Well, I, I'm so excited for them. It was on Fox, so I was really happy that you know the ratings were so great and Fox did so well. Obviously excited for the USA. It's a fun time of year, and, and um, it's a bummer it happens only every four years because we were, we were away and with a bunch of friends and had a really nice breakfast and watched the championship game. And it's cool to hear all the chatter. Um, like I said, it is such a shame that it only happens once every four years. Could it be cool to celebrate those women all the time like that? Um, look, I wish them nothing but the best in their fight for equal pay as a female. Obviously, that's something I'm very into, can get behind, obviously, behind it as well. And, and they're all great women. I see them a lot of events. Probably going to have one on Dancing with the Stars, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so happy for yeah. them. And so what's next for you? I mean, you're, you're busy. You've done lots of endorsement deals. Um, are you doing anything for yourself now? Yeah, a couple of projects that we're working on. I'm trying to work on a scripted project. We're trying. I would love to host a game show trying to get that to work somehow. And actually gonna tease right here, coming out in October, um, going to be or releasing, announcing, I guess, um, a athleisure line that's gonna be coming out. Can't really say too Can't much about that. it, but okay. check her out. We will, we will. Um, For somebody that lives in athleisure. As, as a, <laughs> me, <laughs> not today. Um, <laughs> as a trailblazer, what's the one piece of advice you'd give to this audience in terms of blazing their own trail? It's one I'm still working on, and I feel like I've had a, a, a tough lesson in it, but um, being a female in a you know, male-dominated industry, 
you have to have thick skin. And I remember one of my favorite NHL coaches said that to me, who was with the Tampa Bay Lightning at the time and won a Stanley Cup with them, John Tortorello, former New York Rangers head coach. Um, just, you have to have thick skin, especially now more than ever. Even when I started, social media was a big deal, but everyone has an opinion. Everyone has an opinion. And what's so hilarious about the whole thing is they think it's so easy where I'd be like, okay, <laughs> you're on uh, and 50 million people are watching. You go. Yeah. <laughs> you try. You ask Tom Brady yeah. that. Um, it's really hard. And you know what? Uh, uh, we all try. It's funny. I was talking to J.J. Watt about this one time, and he was just saying, you know, it, it, social media is just you have so many people in a stadium cheering you on, and then you have that one person that rips you on social media, and it ruins your whole day. And it's like, why are we letting people do this? I will tell you a little trick of what's changed my life over the last six months. Who's listening to Oprah's Soul Sessions? Holy crap. And especially here, if I lived here, I'm doing it in LA, like driving on the 405, the 101. Um, you know, it just takes forever. And true story, I listened to the one she had the other day about the Holocaust survivor. I think it's called The Choice. Unreal, crying in my car. Missed the exit because I couldn't see through a tear. It's like, oh my God, this is really like not safe at all. Um, but. God, it's amazing, and it's really made me look at things so differently. You know, you don't have to play the victim card. You just give positivity back. So much toxins are in you if you're negative, and and you you know spew it back at people. So I'm gonna try to remember that with social media. But that's a big one with me. I try not to look at social media after my games or after dancing with the stars because you could work your rear end off studying, and one person just ruins it with their stupid comment that they ignorant comment that they have no idea how much time you've put in. Yeah, I'll three million of your social media right. followers. <laughs> That's a lot right. to ignore. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to thank you. I oh, know sure. you came yesterday or came going home today. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate you being oh, here and joining sure. us. Before you go, we have three minutes. I want to ask Love the it. audience if any questions. Anything. Anything. Sure. Hi, I'm Lauren, Hi, Lauren, and thanks for thanks for being here today. Oh, yeah. So you, you are so confident and very inspirational, and and at, uh, real talk, uh, you know, clearly you have always been in a tough environment where, as you said, you have to grow a thick skin. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you do that and still show up every day being your authentic self? Because you have to have an armor, but you don't want to compromise who you are. Can you talk about that? Look, I faced the hardest thing ever. I had a guy stalking me and put video of me all over the internet and I didn't have a choice. And that's something I'm still dealing with. And I think the crazy thing about it, as much as, you know, I could have run and hide and not come back, but my safe place, which is so psycho when I say it out loud, is on that football field with those players on television. I mean, I had cervical cancer all throughout 2017 season of the NFL season. I didn't talk about it or tell anyone except for my team, my family, uh, a couple of my coworkers. And I, you know, I, I had surgery on a Tuesday and I was back on the field on a Sunday and the doctor's like, don't do that, that's not good. And I was like, no, you don't understand. This is my safe place. Um, I feel my confidence and I feel my best when I'm just there. I don't know what it is. It's just something that I thrive off of. I mean, I'm having a big discussion right now with my husband about having a high risk pregnancy at 41, being a cervical cancer survivor. And there's a lot of talk that I could be on bed rest. And I literally looked at my husband and I'm like, I go on bed rest. I miss that Super Bowl. Baby, this marriage ain't making it. <laughs> I'm like, this baby ain't, bad. I'm not making it. Like, it is what makes me the happiest. Now, again, I'll complain week eight, week nine, I'm exhausted. These bags under my eyes are nasty. You know, like, I don't know what's clean and what's dirty in my laundry basket, but it is my happiest. And that's where I know, like, I have still so much to grow and so much to do in this industry. What the heck was your question? I feel like I like, <laughs> breezed right through it. I think you got it. <laughs> you answered it by talking about staying true to your passion. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> well said. Who's next? Anyway. Yeah. Hi, Erin. Thanks Hi. for being here. I'm Maya, Maya Jones, and I have my own website, shadesoflongisland.com. And um, I want to ask you, because I've been trying to get back into like presenting in front of people and getting back comfortable with that. So do you have any tips as to like 
get rid of like nerves or nervous energy or anything like that. My armpits are sweating so bad right now. (laughs) I don't. Here, for me, what's crazy is I can do games and I know that they're going to 100 million people, 50 million people. I'm okay talking to that black circle of a camera lens, but if I were to stand up here and do a speech, I'm not good with that. I can't do a speech. I'm better rapping off of Lisa. I'm better rapping off all of you guys. Um, It's hard. It's really, really hard. I think the biggest thing, which I never do, my dad always tells me to do, take a deep breath, slow down, which I'm Mm. not doing. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I mean, you know, Joe Buck, who I work with and I love so much, I kept screwing up over and over in a rehearsal we had at a Green Bay game. Tell me if you've heard this before, and Rogers had a calf injury. I say that, I love him, I can say that. Um, yeah, he always has calf injuries. So we were talking about his calf injury, and I, I was doing a hit, because he had just talked to me on the field and told me he didn't know if it was gonna hold up, and blah, 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 blah. So I was trying to give the report, and this is just practice, before this is our rehearsal before we go live, and I was screwing it up. So finally my producer gets in my ear, and he's like, Joe's calling you. What? He can just talk to me in my ear. And he's like, Joe's calling you. Picked up the phone, and Joe goes, what the? is wrong with you? And I go, I just can't get it out. And he goes, it's not brain surgery. It's Aaron Rodgers' calf. (laughs) Give me 15 seconds and throw it back up to me. Come (laughs) on. And I'm like, shit, you're right. Okay. So you know what? Just practice, I guess. Like my dad used to tell me all the time, read the paper over and over out loud. Like get, get comfortable hearing your voice. I hate my voice, so I don't even know why I'm telling you that. But... (laughs) Just practice reading over and over, I guess. <laughs> Video yourself on your f- iPhone. I don't know. I, good I advice. get nervous all the time, and I've been doing this for so long. My first hit back, like, for our first game of the season, Dallas Giants, I will, like, be dry heaving in my mouth. Like, it's... <laughs> I cannot give you any good advice. Sorry. <laughs> Just being honest, right? I'm being true. <laughs> Anyone else? I can stay for a minute. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I touched on it really briefly um, about the, the soccer yeah. uh, team. How much immunity do you have to speak? You know, coming from Fox Sports, you know, you kind of puts you in a position. And I, you, you, you handle that question really gracefully because I know but that I there's probably a lot. It, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. It's hard. Uh, with so, many, so much social media influence. How much can you say? How much can you do? I can't. You can't. <laughs> no, it's just true. And we ran into this a couple years ago with the players kneeling during our anthem and a lot of backlash and everybody wanted us to answer it. We can't. We can't. We work for a network that pays the National Football League billions of dollars. We cannot comment on it. It is our job to keep our mouth shut. If I wanted to have an opinion, I would go work for a network that did, but I can't. I have to report on it. I have to see, I have to talk to the players and see if they're affected by it. It's it's not how I feel. And I know that there are some people that may be absolutely, you know, ticked off about that. But as I would always say, you don't come to me for your politics and what I feel. You go to Fox, you go to CNN for that. You come to me to get my take on how Aaron Rodgers is looking on the sideline, how Tom Brady is looking on the, like I'm not who you want to go to for politics. I can tell you what it's like to be a woman in the industry. I can tell you, you know, what it's like if men, you know, if I'm treated differently from men, but yeah, you don't want to come to me for that stuff anyways. And we're really not, not, I can't say allowed to speak about it, but it's looked down upon. We have to be status quo. It, it's interesting. It's like it's why you don't see, you know, and maybe this is a bad example. Somebody like a, a Robin Roberts or a Michael Strahan, they can't do endorsements. They can't talk about what they like on TV and sell it and get money for it because they're in the news. They have to. They're reporters. They're not reporters. They're what are they? Anchors. Co-hosts. Sure. And <laughs> they're they are supposed to stay unbiased. Right there. Hi. Big fan of oh, uh, Dancing with the Stars. So, to be biased behind the stage, who should have won that didn't win? On my season? I'll tell you season 10 who should have won. The girl who had no dance experience should have won. (laughs) I'm sorry, the Pussycat Doll should not have won. I I think that's wrong. So, who should have won last year? When? Last year. Uh, (laughs) Who else? 
else was competing? Oh, Alexis and who else? Alexa and who else? I don't even remember. <laughs> well, and then on that part, I work for ABC, so I can't <laughs> yeah. say a thing. Good answer.